Some good news and some bad news about International Harvester tonight, along with a great deal of speculation. IH announced today that it lost $4 million over the last few months, but that's a great improvement over the same period last year, when the company's losses added up to more than $100 million. What this means to the Quad Cities is very unclear tonight, as News Center's Pat Anson is here to explain. Don, after being on the verge of bankruptcy, IH is now much closer to making some money again. But the profit is not coming from its farm equipment division. That was the main topic of discussion yesterday at the IH Board of Directors meeting in Springfield, Ohio. The board is thinking very hard about a major restructuring of the company's egg operations. No final decisions have been made yet, but this morning the company's chairman made it very clear that plant closures of some kind are likely. It, honestly, I can say honestly, I, I, I can't foresee us solving the problem without closing one or two more plants. However, we at this point in time haven't determined which they should be. There have been persistent rumors in the Quad Cities that IH is going to close its combine plant in East Moline, but we've heard of another distinct possibility. The company is actively considering the closure of its plant in Memphis, Tennessee, and if that happens, the Memphis operations may be moved up to the Quad Cities. IH manufactures cotton pickers and spare parts in Memphis and currently employs about 600 people there. There is plenty of room at the East Moline plant to handle that type of operation, but workers there are being kept in the dark about what's going on. No, oh, we've heard, uh, you know, from a, from a total plant shut down to nothing to gaining stuff. And you know, today we, there was a rumor going around that we were supposed to get some of Memphis's work, and well, you never know. We hear all kinds of stuff. I wait until, until uh, whatever happened happened. Okay. I really don't believe they're going to close this plant. You never know. No, we're going on. That's that's for sure. You're pretty sure East Moline will stay open. You bet. Right. The only thing that is certain is more layoffs are coming down. It's just a question of where. Well, Pat, how many IH workers are on layoff now? 15,000 right now, which is about 2,000 more than IH has working for it right now. So we'll be hearing a lot more on this particular subject. A lot more over the next couple of months. Okay, thank you, Pat. As many as 1,500 Quad Cityans may be without gas and electricity soon. That's because Iowa, Illinois Gas and Electric is getting tough with the people who owe back utility bills. Tonight, News Center's Pat Anson tells us about a Davenport family who has been disconnected. If this apartment looks like it's dark, it's because it is. Tim and Michelle Freeman, along with their three-year-old daughter, Heather, have been without gas and electricity for the past week. The only light they've had until this morning was for our TV camera. Over the past few days, Iowa, Illinois' customer service office has been flooded by people trying to get their utilities reconnected. The Freemans showed up today to do the same. They've been able to stay with relatives since their utilities were shut off, but getting them turned back on again is going to hurt. Tim was out of work for six months last year, and the bills just stacked up. This one was for almost $500. It's taken all my paycheck, plus some that I've received from information and referral. Okay. Is it you get paid every two weeks? Yeah. What are you going to do for the next two weeks? Just Pray. borrow or something like that. The Freemans were lucky. Information Referral, a social agency that helps people with similar problems, has had to turn others away. Funding for its project aid program is running short. We're trying to take what limited funds we have and try to stretch it to help as many people. Um, sadly enough, that means some people can't be helped. Less than an hour after getting their bill paid, the Freemans' gas and electricity were turned back on again. But this story may not have a happy ending. The Freemans still owe Iowa, Illinois another $200, and unless that bill is paid by April 17th, the utilities will be turned off again. Pat Anson, News Center 6, Davenport. For the past several nights, we've been talking about life after a heart attack. There are several things victims can do to make themselves healthier. Getting regular exercise, giving up cigarettes, and eating more wholesome foods are just a few. But there's one aspect of life they can't control, and that's how society reacts to their problem. New Center's Pat Anson will be talking about that in the final part of his series on cardiac rehabilitation. Andrea, coming home from the hospital or going back to work are two very important psychological steps for someone recovering from a heart attack. Jane Klo was one of the lucky ones. She was able to go back to work just two months after having a heart attack in January. 
they were very understanding mm -hmm. about allowing me to come back on a part-time basis to begin with. And then after uh, a couple of weeks of part-time, I went back full-time. And everybody was real helpful and helped me ease back into things. So there wasn't any problem there. Keith Coborn was not so lucky. Because of his age and the severity of his heart problem, Coborn won't be fighting fires again as a Rock Island fireman. He tried many times to find some other type of work, but was always turned down. I think that's really one reason why I gained weight afterwards. I just kind of gave up. Like, I was trying to find work, and I could, and I got kind of discouraged, and I just kind of gave up on everything, but uh, uh, that didn't last very long. I got back in gear. Having a heart attack at any age can be traumatic, but for Tom Bronson, the trauma was even more acute. He was only 30 and had a wife and two kids to worry about. Everything's thrown in, I guess you'd call it a turmoil. Uh, the situation at home and, and within the family. Uh, because they're wondering, what's his next step? Is it going to be his last? It took, I would say, a good month to really feel like he's all right. I, I don't have to worry about that I'm going to fall asleep and I'm going to wake up and he's going to be gone. You know, it... it it took that long to really feel secure that, yes, he's definitely all right. The Bronsons say they're closer now as a couple and that they've learned to enjoy life a lot more. There you go. Tom is even playing golf again. It was on a golf course last August when he felt the first chest pains. Well, Pat, obviously you have to make a lot of changes if you have a heart attack. What do you think is the most important? Andrea, changing your diet, uh, getting more exercise, giving up smoking are all very important, but the heart attack victims I talked to say the most important step they made was in just developing a, a good attitude about their future. The cast of characters in this story is a little bizarre, but here goes. There's Goosey the Gander and Lucy the Goose, a rabbit named Peter, and a chicken named Henrietta. All these animals belong to Anna Bloomy and her husband Vernon, a Silvis couple who live next door to this man, Joe Campagna. Campagna says the geese foul up the neighborhood. They honk and defecate all over the area. How would you like if you had these ducks and goose in your yard and they defecate like crazy? No, they don't. Honest, they don't. If they sneak out, well, we just hurry up and get them back in if they... But they never get out. No. Campagna took his complaint to City Hall, and City Hall, after ducking the issue for a few months, took the Bloomies to court. The prosecution was armed with an ordinance that prohibits anyone from raising poultry within city limits. But the judge took a gander at the evidence and decided that since the Bloomies have had their pets longer than the city has had its ordinance, Goosey and his friends could stay. I'm glad it went the way it did, I, because the animals, we try to keep them real quiet. And, uh, they never cause any trouble. We keep them clean. They don't have a smell. We've never had a complaint from anyone. What are you going to do now? Well, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, see the attorney again, and uh, when these things get loose, to get the, uh, the sheriff or the uh, police or whatever to have to see that she keeps them where they belong. <laughs> The moral to this story is clear. You can slander a gander in Silvis these days, and you better not let your goose get on the loose. For NBC News, Pat Anson reporting from Silvis, Illinois. The streets of downtown Chicago can be hectic and noisy almost any time of day, but they're tame compared to what goes on in this building. People have been yelling, pushing, and waving at each other at the Chicago Board of Trade for the past 136 years. On the surface, what the traders do here may not seem to make a lot of sense, but in many ways they determine whether a farmer makes a profit on this year's corn crop whether he buys a new piece of farm machinery next spring or whether he goes broke next fall. The farmer has a particular problem. The farmer is a price taker on all sides. He's a price taker on the commodities that he raises and sells, whether it's a, uh, in the grains, oil seeds, or livestock. And he views the Board of Trade in many instances as a 
as an unpleasant and evil phenomenon because the Board of Trade is bringing him a message quite often that he doesn't like. Kotke and the other traders can sell everything from gold to soybeans. Their transactions rarely lead to an actual exchange of goods, but they do create a market price that's recognized throughout the world. On an average day, just an average day, between 12 and 14 billion dollars worth of commodities are traded here. That has led to complaints from some farm groups who say grain prices are being manipulated by speculators out to make a fast buck. We're just tired of being everybody's, uh, everybody's scapegoat in this thing. Uh, it's, it's not our fault. Charlie Clement sits on the Board of Trade's Board of Directors. The dollar is too strong, and there's no export demand for our product. And I think in Iowa, I believe the figure is 25% of the agricultural product is exported in Iowa. Well, with the dollar so strong, we, there's just no export demand. And it has nothing to do with uh, the Board of Trade or anybody. It's just uh, we've got to get this dollar down. Good evening, everyone. The third time was not the charm. No, it wasn't. Oscar Mayer got a massive no today from union workers to its final contract offers. But that doesn't mean the union will go on strike. New Center's Pat Anson says the union will return to work next week, but perhaps under some sort of protest. To laugh. Take it home. It'll be good toilet paper. Real good toilet paper. That's how most of the Oscar Mayer workers in Davenport felt about the two contracts they were being asked to approve. They didn't even bother voting on one of them, while the other, which would have cut wages by almost two and a half dollars an hour, wound up being voted down by a two to one margin. They now for the vote, 396 to reject, to accept. Only minutes earlier, Oscar Mayer workers in Madison, Wisconsin voted the same way on the same offer. The new contract may have been rejected, but there's a provision in the old one that lets Oscar Mayer institute a new wage scale of its own. So next week, the company plans to recall about 500 workers and put them back to work at its Davenport plant. Production workers will be paid $8.25 an hour, the same wage they refuse to accept today. Given the choice of losing their jobs or taking a pay cut, most workers are saying they'll take the pay cut. Are you going to go back to work next week? Yeah, we, we're going to have to go back to work. You know, we cannot refuse to go back to work. We're going to have to go back to work. Well, I suppose we'll have to. If we don't go on strike, we'll have to go back to work. But I think the whole package stinks, what they're offering us and everything. Union officials say Oscar Mayer may have won this battle, but the company will face some very hard bargaining when negotiations begin on a new contract a year from now. I've seen bankruptcies, I've seen divorces, I've even seen suicides over this. There's a bomb out there, and it's got a fuse on it. And I almost predict whatever happens to the economy doesn't make any difference. In September of 1985, you're going to see the packing house workers of this country. You're going to see a war. And I predict that no one will be able to stop it. The war may have already begun. Union members declined to take a strike vote today, but they still have that option. An option they won't let the company forget. Pat Anson, News Center 6, Davenport. This is WOC-TV, Channel 6, Davenport, Iowa, the recognized leader in television news. Now, Don Ryan, Andrea Zinga, Tom Cornelis, sports, and the exclusive John Collins weather. This is News Center 6. Good evening, a disappointing trip tops our news. Evidently, efforts to save the Rock Island Farm Oil plant fizzled in Houston, Texas today. Rock Island Mayor Jim Davis and Illinois Governor Jim Thompson returned to the Quad Cities empty-handed this afternoon. They had been in Houston to try to convince Tenneco, the new owners of International, to keep the farm oil plant operating. But News Center's Pat Anson, who was at the meeting today, reports Tenneco's answer was a foregone conclusion. Governor Thompson and Mayor Davis came to Houston with few illusions about persuading Tenneco to buy the farm oil plant or find some use for it. And after a 90-minute meeting with Tenneco Chairman Jim Kettleson, they were ready to concede the inevitable. There is literally nothing that the state of Illinois or the city of Rock Island can do to make it profitable to continue farm oil as a tractor operation. 
The immediate future also doesn't look too bright for what's left of the farm equipment industry in the Quad Cities. Kettleson is already talking about further cuts in production by J.I. Case. Uh, we started out uh, the year as the entire industry with about a year's supply in dealers' hands. That's too damn much inventory. It has to be cut. And so we're going to have to suffer in the short run. And it hurts us. It's, it's very tough profitably uh, to have a bunch of closed plants and uh, run an organization. We're going to take that hit this year in order to clean the books and be ready uh, to go in 1986. The one bright spot in all of this is that Tenneco has pledged to help Rock Island and the state find a new tenant for Farmall. And Thompson says some companies are already getting interested. My understanding is that some companies have been through the plant. Uh, but I don't know any more than that, and I don't think many people know more than that. Companies at this stage of, of development of product uh, look at all options. Thompson wouldn't identify the companies involved, but did say that he's already talked to a Japanese firm about moving to Rock Island. The Sun Belt hasn't been too sunny in Houston lately. Last night it snowed here for the first time in 10 years. But Governor Thompson and Mayor Davis are leaving this city with at least a glimmer of hope that some use can be found for Farmall. Pat Anson, News Center 6, Houston. Texas blizzards permitting, we expect Pat back in the News Center for more on the Tenneco Farmall story tonight. It remains bleak. The industry has shown few signs of picking up. But Don, despite the poor economy, there are signs the Quad City real estate market is picking up. New Center's Pat Anson reports declining prices and lower interest rates have made it a buyer's market. This is one of over 3,000 homes up for sale in the Quad Cities, an increase of 27% in the past year alone. It's a good sized living room, especially with the window. Mm -hmm. you know. Lisa Null and her husband moved to the Quad Cities last September, and after four months of renting a home, now they're ready to buy one. Right now, with the economy the way it is, there are more houses coming on the market. The interest rates are down, and now would be a good time to buy. The Nulls have picked a good time to begin looking. Interest rates are at their lowest level in five years, down to 9 or even 8% for adjustable rate mortgages. There is also a glut of homes on the market, so many that some owners are willing to sell at a loss. We've seen a real depreciation in the housing market in terms of prices right now. The inventory is very realistically priced. I think anyone who has their house on the market at this point is very serious about selling it. I've worked with several people who have taken a, a real loss on their property. They've actually had to pay in order to sell. So far, the increase in housing sales has been very lopsided, with most of the activity in the Iowa Quad Cities. Across the river in Illinois, where the economy is worse, sales are still very sluggish. How long this buyer's market will continue is anyone's guess. Most realtors are happy with what they've seen so far, and if interest rates stay down, they're hoping that sales pick up even more by summer. Pat Anson, New Center 6, Davenport. The slump in manufacturing in the Quad Cities is beginning to take its toll nearby, for instance, in Geneseo. New Center's John Teal 